when the minority community's feelings are shattered when you'd murder one of us in cold blood, they don't really have anything to say about that, do we? But here we are, rising up constantly from all of that pain, so maybe your bourgeoisie boot-licking snowflake ass can take a few jokes thrown in your direction, Officer Bacon. Oink, oink, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Fork Full of Noodles. I'm your host, Krish Mohan. Hey, quick note, what you're about to see uh, throughout this video is from the live virtual comedy shows I'm doing called the Citizen Revolution Comedy Show. So throughout these episodes, you guys are going to hear some people laughing in the background and that's because it is recorded in front of a live virtual audience uh, in, a, in, in the Zoom showroom so to speak. And if you want to be a part of this, if you want to be a part of these live virtual events, you can grab tickets for future shows right now. They're happening every single Friday at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. So you can grab your tickets. Go to the, go to the description. Check out the link for these shows. Come join us. Uh, and I'm going to be donating a portion of the ticket sales to various different grassroots organizations, activists, journalists, and small business venues. Uh, every single week it'll be different material. Every single week it'll be a different um, organization or venue that I will be helping out. So that's, uh, that's something that you can, you can be a part of if you choose so. So grab your tickets. Now on to the episode. Before we get into this week's episode, I just want to let you guys know that content like this is often suppressed. So uh, I need your help to make sure that people see this video. Uh, so make sure you hit the subscribe button. Make sure you hit the like button if you enjoy this stuff. And if you want to support uh, this show and, and all of the, the content that I produce uh, on a weekly basis, you can become a sustaining member over on my website at ramennoodlescomedy.com slash donate. You can become a sustaining member directly on my website or via Patreon. And you get a bunch of uh, cool stuff. You get early access to longer full episodes of Forkful of Noodles. You get uh, unreleased uh, stand-up comedy and storytelling stuff. You get free tickets to virtual and live stand-up comedy shows. Uh, so go to ramennoodlescomedy.com slash donate uh, and consider becoming a sustaining member or making a one-time donation. Now on to the episode. So in today's society, when you hear the words Black Panther, it usually evokes a 20-something crossing their arms and screaming, Wakanda forever! <laughs> <laughs> but if you mention Huey Newton, Fred Hampton, Bobby Seale to these people, they just stare at you and say, they don't really remember who the actor that played the Black Panther was, mm -hmm. but he was very good and he definitely deserves an Oscar. But what those names should evoke are the words revolution, organizers, and progress. And look, as much as I love those Marvel movies, I gotta say, they haven't particularly captured the spirit of the Black Panther, even in the comic books. Hell, the second issue had him fighting the Ku Klux Klan after the board, <laughs> yeah, it's true. The board at Marvel requested there be more white characters introduced into the <laughs> books. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's just another one. <laughs> yeah, they they were they got quiet real fucking quick. Um. The real Black Panthers came out of a need for social revolution in America in the '60s, and that need is still here today. So it's important to know what they did right, where they dropped the ball, and how and why they were attacked by the establishment while driving social change and paradigm shifts. Aside from the comic book character, the only thing we really know about these gr this group is that they were militant black men out for black freedoms with guns and leather and sunglasses and <laughs> 
all of which were black. Great <laughs> <laughs> picture. <Yeah. movement. laughs> I don't know. The Black Panthers were created by Bobby Seale and Huey Newton in 1965 after the assassination of Malcolm X. At this point, there were riots over police brutality in predominantly black neighborhoods. And this was also a time when protesters were having dogs sicked on them and marchers were being hosed down. And this is how you know that teaching racism has gotten out of hand when dogs are trained to be racist. Oh. Oh. Right? Dogs have no interest in judging people based on melanin contest content, right? <laughs> they only have interest in belly rubs and who's got the treats. <laughs> well, aren't we all? We, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Look, I feel like teaching dogs to be racist goes against the Eighth Amendment of cruel and unusual punishment. Emphasis on unusual. <laughs> Listen, you got to be real weird to try to teach a dog the N-word. <laughs> also racist. You have to be very, very racist. <laughs> it's the same thing with horse cops, right? Those, those horses don't want to be an instrument of oppression. They want to be <laughs> free. You know, eating apples from the hands of horse whisperers. Not... <laughs> Not having oh. commands shouted at them by Sergeant Pepper Spray. <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> That'll I like that. <laughs> Look, every time I see a horse at a protest, I have to wonder if these horses are thinking, this is bullshit. Now, my life matters too, motherfucker. <laughs> I'm, I'm not just here to let you bear mace innocent people. You know, I really have to wonder how many horses put their two weeks notice in after a protest against police brutality. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Oh, sweet. Oh, my God. <laughs> This is only the intro. <laughs> <laughs> now, Huey Newton was a law student that knew how to protect himself in the streets, right? Newton introduced the idea of how militarized the police are by saying they occupy black neighborhoods as troops occupying a territory. Really, this is taking Manifest Destiny a bit too far, isn't it? <laughs> The cops are no longer protecting and serving. They're all about manifesting and destinying. <laughs> now, if you are unfamiliar. Uh, so, so where's the lie? Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, if you're unfamiliar with Manifest Destiny, that's the idea that all of the land was destined to be America's. And if you pray hard enough, or rather more accurately, if you pillage hard enough, hmm. they take their land theirs, which would then fulfill their destinies. You know, it's a, it's a real pull yourself up by your bootstraps approach to oppression. <laughs> I really appreciate that effort. Now, right now, America has 1,000 military bases around the globe, which just means that Manifest Destiny has been franchised like a Subway or McDonald's. No. Yeah. <laughs> For every base that occupies it, your territory, you get one free toy that says upward mobility. <laughs> <laughs> Hooray, freedom via merchandise depression. Hey. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> oh, my God. Right? <laughs> Look, I just think Manifest Destiny is an incredibly juvenile philosophy, right? It's basically the called it a foreign policy. <laughs> I hear, misheard. The what? The called it, you know? The, like, when you're just like, hey, what is that? Guam called it. America calling it right there. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> 
Zach, Zach, Korea called it first. America, Dale and it called it. It's ours. We called it. That's ours. That's mm. it's Manifest Destiny in a nutshell. I licked it first. Oh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Somebody has siblings. <laughs> now, Bobby Seal was a genius organizer. And he was also a natural born rapper. But instead of starting a band like most college kids do, he came up with the Panther tagline and really what became their mission. Power to the people, power to all the people. And just within that statement alone, the myth of black nationalism and militancy is dissolved. The Black Panthers believed that society's issues were coming from a systemic level, specifically poverty, which has affected people of all races and creeds. Now, if this sounds familiar, it's because a lot of progressives and anti-establishment activists, organizers, commentators, and comedians are still saying this stuff today. <laughs> Guys, the Black Panthers pointed this out in 1966. That's 54 years ago. What is the time limit on trying ideas that don't work and finally, finally listening to the voice of the people? Is it like 55 years? <laughs> Now, Newton also said, uh, we're here to transform society and erect a system where people will receive justice. So in order to specify what they meant, they came up with their 10-point program, which in reality was just addressing basic human rights. And I'll cover them more, uh, a little bit more in depth in just a, just a few minutes here. But one of the aspects of the 10-point plan was to end police brutality of Black people in America. Now, after the cops murdered another young black kid, which was basically the discriminatory cherry on the Jim Crow cake, which if you're wondering, is just a big pile of flour. <laughs> because it's all white, because the flour ah. is all white. Yeah. <laughs> Some of these jokes are gonna be very subtle. Uh, <laughs> But after, the, after the, the, the murder of yet another young black kid at the hands of the cops, the Panthers decided to start their first initiative called Cop Watch. With Huey Newton being a law student, he knew that California Penal Code 12020 to 12027 states that people were allowed to observe the police from a safe distance. And the Second Amendment granted them the right to bear arm during these observations. And if the police decided to shoot them, they had a right to defend themselves. So here is what Huey had to say. The uh, California Penal Code section 12020 through 12027 and also the Second Amendment of the Constitution guarantees the citizen a right to bear arms on public property. Huey said we're going to carry our guns and we're going to follow the police and if they stop some we're going to stop, we're going to maintain a legal distance, and we're going to observe these so-called law officers in the performance of their duty. Now, of course, this irritated the police officers, which then prompted Republicans to say that they needed tighter restrictions on gun laws. That's right, folks. Republicans <laughs> against guns. <laughs> now, <laughs> it's hard to believe. Look, I try not to make all of the issues about race, right? But this one is just a little bit too obvious. All of a sudden, a bunch of black guys with guns show up to ensure that a mustachioed cop wasn't going to kill another innocent civilians, and the Republicans want to pretend like the Second Am Amendment doesn't exist. Now, had this been a white dude mm. with a sawed-off shotgun and a water bottle full of chew, the cops might have deputized him for a week. <laughs> <laughs> Now, in today's society, we do have a version of Cop Watch. It's using our cell phones and going live on social media. And of course, unleashing the wrath of our Karens, threatening to contact a manager. <laughs> That's right, we're using Karens for good, you guys. We, we're, we're about to exercise our constitutional oh. right to speak oh for 100% of the managers. <laughs> Bring them on. 
<laughs> right? Plus, we have the Black Lives Matter movement that is keeping violent and unjust cops at bay with protests and demonstrations for every innocent person killed by the police. <laughs> now, in today's society, there aren't really Republicans advocating for tighter restrictions on guns, right? And they're, rather, they're, they're kind of flooding the market with them. Freedom! But in order to get that, you have to duel your neighbors. <laughs> Just go ahead and take 10 paces. That's one for every <laughs> amendment you don't understand. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and when there's a black NRA member that's shot by the cops, like Philando Castile in Minneapolis a couple years ago, the Republicans stay silent. They all scurry away into Mitch McConnell's turtle shell and hide there until everything blows <laughs> up. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the eyes. That's, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. That's spot on. <laughs> they only peek out when they need to blame the mentally ill or Muslims. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Now, in 1967, the Republicans decided they need to restrict open carry, right? And the Black Panthers decided that uh, to protest that ruling. Uh, and Bobby Seale took 30 Panthers down to the California State House, brandished with rifles, handguns, shotguns. And this was happening at the same time that Governor Ronald Reagan was talking to the future leaders of America. You know, these people, they're the ones that keep trying to tell you that they're legislating on your behalf by telling you that corporations will trickle everything down. Yeah, and of course, the media freaked out thinking the Panthers were some kind of a gun club. The Black Panther Party for Self-Defense calls upon the American people in general and the black people in particular to take careful note of the racist California legislature, which is now considering legislation aimed at keeping the black people disarmed and powerless at the very same time racist police agencies throughout the country are intensifying the terror, brutality, murder, and repression of black people. That was Bobby Seale, by the way. Um... Now, here's the thing. They eventually made it to the California Senate to talk about why passing the bill was a bad idea and what they stood for, as you just saw. And Bobby Seale, that, that was Bobby Seale addressing the media and outlining their 10-point program for human rights, right? After all that, the Panthers went to a gas station about a mile away where the cops confiscated all of their guns and charged them under conspiracy and arrested all of them. And that includes Bobby Seale. Yet, we really haven't arrested any of the corporate media for spreading McCarthy's conspiracy for the last four years. And neither have we arrested my neighbor who keeps saying that our landlady is a mole person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right? I'm sorry, Andy. She's, it's, it's not true. She just doesn't want to have dinner with you. It's a different thing. It's a different thing. <laughs> Now, the Congressman Chris, Chris, out. It's Chris's fault. <laughs> now, uh, a Congressman did come out and uh, they passed the bill um, and they said that they were scared and out of fear that this Panther bill had to be passed in 1967. Now, Ronald Reagan is quoted to say, I don't think loaded guns is a way to solve a problem that should be solved among people of goodwill. Anyone oh. who would approve of this demonstration is out of their mind. <laughs> That's a direct quote from, from the old Gipper himself. <laughs> now, oh, fuck that guy. <laughs> yeah. According to this logic, though, <laughs> the cops that have killed innocent unarmed people, whether they were black or otherwise, according to God King Reagan, are clinically insane right Op open up the loot against people god king reagan oh <laughs> yeah. my god i'm embarrassed we got we got some cops to check into these loony bins guys you know look apparently the thin blue line is a psychological diagnosis which 
Which begs the question, does that mean oh, an asshole <laughs> is a pre-existing condition for cops? Yeah. <laughs> oh <laughs> it's a very important question, I think. I say that my oh, oops, went a little too ahead. Uh, sorry about that. But here's a, here's a real question for Republicans, right? Um, when you think of the gold standard of Republican, what do you think they would say about the AR-15? And how deep the dick of the NRA is down the throat of the party today? You know? <laughs> Do you think the Gipper would call you crazy, you know? And now look, before everybody freaks out and says I'm sexist for making it a dick and not a lady part, there is a reason. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can't wait to hear okay. this. <laughs> <laughs> look, most Republicans are homophobic as well as racist. Okay, I'm just trying to make them gag both physically and mentally at the sight of their guns. <laughs> oh, 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 hell yeah. Right? So this is like a really progressive joke, you guys. <laughs> now, here's the thing. Eventually in a shootout, Officer John Fry is killed and Huey Newton is blamed for it. Newton gets put into prison. So now both party leaders are behind bars. So this brought in Eldridge Cleaver who's the third person on the screen, right? Uh, Eldridge Cleaver was an intellectual that had credibility with both the white and the black communities. Uh, Cleaver was a little bit more bombastic than Newton and Seal, right? He even said that he beat Ronald Reagan with a marshmallow in a duel. I say that Ronald Reagan is a punk, a fifty, and a coward. And I challenge you to a duel. I challenge you. I challenge you to a duel to the death or until he says Uncle Elgin. Right. And I give him his choice of weapons. He could use a gun, a knife, a baseball bat, or a marshmallow, and I'll beat him to death with a marshmallow. <laughs> That's how I feel about him. <laughs> That's a real thing that happened, you guys. <laughs> a black man threatened to attack a governor and beat him to death with a marshmallow. <laughs> That's a part of American history. <laughs> <laughs> what a country, right? <laughs> so look, as things kept escalating with the cops, the Panthers came up with one of their most iconic sayings, uh, sayings uh, and illustrations that went in their newspapers. <laughs> their cartoons drawn by Emery Douglas read, Fuck the pigs. And the cops said <laughs> that their feelings were hurt when the kids would yell it at them. <laughs> 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 That's a real thing. <laughs> when it was picked up by college students, them saying it, that definitely bothered I was a sergeant patrolling in the project, and there was a cutest little girl. So I stopped to say hello, and I said, hi, honey, how are you doing today? And she looked at me and she said, fuck you, pig. And I thought, we have lost it, man. We have lost it. She was raised right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, the cops make all these speeches and stuff, and they talk about how, you know, it was, uh, it was detrimental to hear these college students and these little girls say, fuck the pigs, you know. But, when the minority community's feelings are shattered when you murder one of us in cold blood, we don't really have anything to say about that, do we? But here we are, rising up constantly from all of that pain, so maybe your bourgeoisie boot-licking snowflake ass can take a few jokes thrown in your direction, Officer Bacon. Oink, oink, motherfucker. <laughs> 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 or, or I think this is a better idea, is maybe you could just stop killing us in the interest of rich people, you know, and maybe serve the community you're actually supposed to serve, do what your badge actually fucking says, and you could do that instead. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, things kept escalating, right? 
There was a lot of back and forth struggle. And things started to dissolve. And this, this back and forth is, is really what started to dissolve the Black Panther Party for self-defense. In 1968, after the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., the violence from the Black Panther Party escalated and led to, to the death of the very first Panther, little Bobby Hutton. Now, before we get to that, the death of Dr. King meant that hope for unity had died with him. There was a lot of anger within the black community, in and out of the Black Panthers, for the man that walked through hells to befriend the oppressor to gain equality, and then he was killed for it. And that anger that they felt was absolutely righteous. Eldridge Cleaver wanted to make a point and decided the party needed to take decisive action and take arms against the police. Now, the elder members knew that this was not a risk that they wanted to take, but the younger members were ready to action. So 17-year-old Bobby Hutton borrowed a shotgun and went out with Cleaver to hunt for cops. Eventually, they did get into a shootout. They got trapped in a basement after the cops had fired tear gas into the house they were in, uh, and the house was going to burn, and Cleaver suggested that they surrender. But in order to make sure that they wouldn't get shot, they needed to go out naked to prove that they were unarmed. Now, Hutton was 17 and he was shy, so he only took off his shirt. The cops killed him. This is the origins of Hands Up, Don't Shoot. And it's a continuing pattern of innocent black kids getting killed by a system protecting its investments first. Also, pants can be very scary. <laughs> You know, according to the cops, you never know if it's just a roll of quarters, you know, or is somebody excited to see them, or if it's a bazooka. <laughs> now, after this uh, incident, Cleaver had disappeared. He later reappeared in Algeria to start the international wing of the Black Panther Party. When Nixon came into power, the Nixon administration was calling for law and order to be returned to the streets. And so go back to the root cause of the problem, creating an overpowered law and order system that oppresses citizens of color that only makes them want to push back. And with both sides escalating actions and tensions, it got a lot of people killed. And it kept a lot of people in prison to this day. One of these escalations included the creation of the Black Liberation Army, which was the militant wing of the Black Panther Party instituted in 1971. So here is uh, one of the people that currently is still in prison. Let's go and look at that. So one of the cases that, was, uh, that has been brought to light over the last few years is the cases, a case of Jalil Muntakim, who was accused of killing two cops in 1971. Muntakim has been in prison for close to 50 years now, despite evidence showing that he didn't fire the gun that killed the two officers uh, in question. And the reason be that he's being denied parole is because he doesn't regret being a Black Panther and a revolutionary. In 2002, he did say that he regrets the death of these two cops, but he doesn't regret being a Black Panther. Now this makes him a political prisoner, and this is the treatment that most of the Black Panthers in prison get too. This is an unconstitutional imprisonment. And it's 2020. It's no longer illegal to be a member of the LGBTQ community. Fuck, it's not even illegal to be a neo-Nazi or a white nationalist. Fuck, you, can, you are still allowed to be a member of the McDonald's Happy Meal Club at age 43. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's getting personal. Yeah, well, you know, you got to keep collecting the toys. Right? <laughs> but if you're a Black Panther that stood up for the people's right, they're going to go ahead and keep you in prison, which continues to prove the point of what we're all fighting for. There, there are those that don't have any sympathy for political prisoners like Munta Kim. In fact, in 2018, it was stated in a press conference that no cop killers should walk the face of the earth. Talking about the parole, the possible parole of cop killers. And yes, they're guilty then, 
and they're guilty now, and no cop killer should ever walk the face of the earth. But we let killer cops walk all over our society every single day, and the laws don't do anything about that. In fact, most times, cops are protected after they take the life of a innocent child, especially if that child was black, like Bobby Hutton. Now, this is the wife of one of the deceased cops, and she's made statements like, uh, if you kill someone that's meant to protect society, then you deserve the death penalty. Look, statements like this are made out of pain and the torment of loss, and they fail to see the other side of the argument. Cop watch was put into place because there was no protection from law enforcement, especially if you were black or brown. The police were not there to serve the communities of color, but rather contain them, as Huey Newton has put it. And in this country that has a torrid history of containing people against their will, perhaps it's time to treat people a little bit better. And through pain and loss, unfortunately, this woman said some unfortunately racist things. There are right now over 19 black radicals that believe in Panther philosophy still in prison today. One of the oldest of these folks is Chip Fitzgerald, who is 80 years old. This is how fragile our criminal justice system is, that it fears an elderly black man that could be returned into society. How feeble is a criminal justice system with its chains of institutionalized racism that it clearly says that it's weaker than an 80-year-old man who should be soaking up the sun in Fort Lauderdale and getting SDIs in his retirement community? <laughs> yeah, I lost my script. Okay. Here's the thing. The Panthers' legacy written by the oligarchs with their media propaganda proxies became about violence in the streets. But that's not really what the Panthers ever stood for, right? Cop watch and the escalation of violence came from one side not listening to the needs of the other. One side not feeling protected or served. And when you turn civic duty into military force, you should expect some pushback. The Second Amendment granted the, the, the citizens of this country to form a well-regulated militia and they misused the shit out of some commas. <laughs> the Black Panther Party at least got one of those things right. I don't know about their comma use, but they were a well-regulated and well-organized revolutionaries that fought intellectually and physically against an unjust system while advocating for some of the most best and progressive ideas we've ever seen in the 20th and 21st century. But since the media and the oligarchs that rule the plutocratic system uh, want the masses to believe that Bobby Seale and, and Huey Newton and Fred Hampton, the rank and file of the Black Panther Party, were some kind of anarcho-terror group trying to raise Black Atlantis from the depths of the Mississippi, I thought it'd be important. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it would be important to talk about their 10 points plan uh, and uh, what, their, what the Black Panthers actually based their philosophies and actions out of. The first point stated this, we want freedom. We want the power to determine our destiny of our Black community. We believe that Black people will not be free until we are able to determine our destiny. This is pretty straightforward. Right? Like, I even think like the most closed-minded individual can say that this is pretty logical and sound. And if you're confused, let's put it this way. What would a rich, out-of-touch white person know about the struggles of an underfunded, over-policed neighborhood? The answer is not a good goddamn thing. <laughs> no. Yeah, especially when you're all unwilling to listen and only care about the retweets and the likes. The second point stated, we want full employment for our people. We believe that the federal government is responsible and obligated to give every man employment or guaranteed income. We believe that the white American businessman will, it, will, it, we believe that if the white American businessman will not give full em, uh, employment, the means of production should be taken from the businessman and replaced in the community so that the people of the community can organize and employ its people and give 
a high standard of living. You, you yeah. said what I'm thinking. Yeah. This is an idea that's still being argued for today, by the way. In 1966, the Black Panthers were not just advocating for a universal basic income, but also a federal jobs guarantee that would ensure that every American is taken care of in this country by a government that should be and it should be for and by the people. Look, even most conservative constitutionalists should be on board with this idea, right? The idea of this nation is to have a government for and by the people. The role of the government should be to provide for us with us in charge. That's what makes universal basic income a constitutional idea, which means consti the, the constitution kind of might be socialist. And if you're hearing some pops, that's because every conservative in the country just had a minor stroke. <laughs> <laughs> As that sentence made it out into the ether. <laughs> now, for as much as Republicans and Democrats are concerned about putting Americans to work, they and their crony capitalist friends don't really provide jobs that equate to a high standard of living or you know, like a standard of living. And right to work advocates say that this notion is false because Americans are doing great. You know, before the 2020 pandemic, they argued that the unemployment rate was so low that there are two, sometimes even three jobs for every American. Incredible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Look at how much they have the right to work and how they're exercising these rights. It's amazing. <laughs> Guys, the sound of victory is an exasperated collective sigh from the working class as they plop onto their couch to pass out after a 19-hour day. <laughs> it's victory right there. You know, America, the land of the employment and the home of the overworked and underrepresented. Look, the unemployment rate due to the pandemic is getting so high that it's becoming mentally ill. That's why it's called a depression, okay? Even the unemployment rate looks at life and asks, oh, what's even the point? <laughs> <laughs> America is so depressed with its high unemployment rate that it hasn't seized the means of its pants in like a century. <laughs> Take your time if you need it to with that one. <laughs> and look, before everybody starts <laughs> arguing with me, uh, I do want to point, it, point this out. There are no fast food employees driving the newest sedan with Bluetooth configurations and a backup camera. They are driving their parents' hand-me-downs that has a very specific way that you have to start the car without the engine catching on fire and spontaneously combusting all no geo metros simultaneously. <laughs> oh my god yeah yep. <laughs> this is a call to abolish class slavery in our society the working class makes virtually no money but is placated to on a consistent basis questions on how we're going to help fund a decent living condition are met with well where where's the money go come from where where where's the money go come from but no such questions are ever asked about bank bailouts, extraordinary military budgets, the like new gold toilets for the rich, and the astronomical amount that we spend on turtle wax, wax that's used on Jeff Bezos' head. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, that vicious dome is so shiny you can see that oppressive glisten from space. <laughs> and the question must be asked, why the working class can't have a higher quality of life where we don't have to work two to three jobs and pretend like that's a good thing. What makes us undeserving of providing a life for ourselves and our family that doesn't involve fearing whether our bills are paid up, our roots don't disappear, and where the next plant of food comes from? And for any politician or person or public figure that goes against the second point of the Black Panther Party, goes against providing a good life for hardworking Americans. Now, the third point states 
We want an end to the robbery by the capitalists of our black community. We believe that this racist government has robbed us and now we are demanding the overdue debt of 40 acres and two mules. 40 acres and two mules were promised 100 years ago as restitution for slave labor and mass murder of black people. We will accept the payment in currency which will be distributed to our many communities. The Germans are now aiding the Jews in Israel for the genocide of the Jewish people. Germans murdered six million Jews. The American racist has taken part in the slaughter of over 50 million black people. Therefore, we feel this is a modest demand that we make. Now, this is the idea of financial reparations, right? And at this point, you can translate 40 acres and two mules to a decent house with two full-size sedans with backup cameras. <laughs> <laughs> but again, this idea is met with a deafening, where's the money go come from? <laughs> you guys, where, where the money go come from? And again, I got to say, why don't you ask your fucking banker friends who keep robbing us blind every chance that they get? In fact, now we're adding our site back to this modest demand as well. That'd be fun to get back. The fourth point states, we want decent housing fit for the shelter of human beings. We believe that if the white landlord will not give decent housing to our black community, then the housing uh, and the land should be made into cooperatives so that our community with government aid can build and make decent housing for its people. Look, housing is a basic human right. The fact that America, in America we see thousands of homeless people that we as a society are unwilling to help means that we're failing to provide human rights to our citizens. And a lot of these homeless folks do have jobs and some of them are veterans. And yes, some of them are mentally unstable, but that doesn't mean that they're undeserving of help. We see this happening today in, in, with what's happening during the pandemic, right? With the loss of jobs and the pay cuts from the working class. There's a moratorium on evictions, but there's no cancellation on rents, mortgages or debt, which means that even though most of us have a roof over their head, our heads, the mounting debt associated with that roof is clogging the gutters and ensures that we might wind up being homeless. Then the banks and other financial institutions can come in and they'll seize these properties, which is heartbreaking and awful. And it'll mean that most of us will have to move back in with our parents. And look, that is an evil that I do not wish on any of my enemies, right? As Americans, <laughs> as Americans, I do believe that we have the right to masturbate in peace, you guys. <laughs> it's part of the human rights. But, you know, hey, silver lining, maybe we can record some of those hijinks and hope we get picked up for like a three season run on CBS. <laughs> you know, maybe if that happens, to we'll get that house back. <laughs> Now here's the thing, the Black Panthers actually put this into effect in their communities in order to protect their family from the FBI who was targeting the Panthers. They called them Panther Pads, which were three to four bedroom apartments uh, that would have uh, maybe 10 Panthers living in there, uh, running rotating chore lists and, uh, uh, and would have 24 hour security as well. So here is what that looked like. You might have a three bedroom apartment that might have 10 Panthers staying there, sharing bedrooms. Uh, the living room was basically also a bedroom. We called them Panther pads. Somebody would be on 24 hour security. Uh, somebody was responsible for cleaning the place. Uh, often it was a rotating list of responsibilities. It was a sense of community that we created. <laughs> The rank and file was the everyday members that did the daily work of the, of, of the party. They the ones that made the party. The backbreakers, the one you put all the work on. Now look, this idea can very easily be put into effect today. And if we did something similar to this, it would help communal living thrive and possibly also end homelessness, which would be huge. 
So the fifth point states, we want education for our people that exposes the true nature of this decadent American society. We want education that teaches us our true history and our role in the present day society. We believe in an educational system that will give our people a knowledge of self. If a man does not have knowledge of himself and his position in society and, uh, and the world, he has little chance to relate to anything else. Here's the thing, history is written by the winners. And that's obviously because if it was written by the losers, it'd be all like whiny and stuff, you know, about how like the winners cheated and how sore the losers are from all of the oppression. The problem is sometimes the bad guys win and try to convince us that they're the good, good guys, which is why history has turned into a college freshman level creative writing workshop. <laughs> Now, American history is boiled into these popcorn facts, like uh, George Washington chopping down the cherry tree so he can manifest destiny produce, right? <laughs> or Ben Franklin inventing electricity with some keys and some STIs. Or Thomas Jefferson owning a mansion in Virginia named after an artisanal pasta sauce, Monticello. <laughs> <laughs> and we celebrate all these three fine American presidents by putting them on currency that we pass around more frequently than Ben Franklin passed around his herpes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> American history likes to celebrate the shit out of robber barons like Andrew Carnegie and John D. Rockefeller mm -hmm but neglects to point out that they constantly advocated for violence against striking workers. Andrew Carnegie specifically was known to publicly claim that he was on the worker's side and then in private would talk about crushing the worker and their precious unions too. Andrew Carnegie would give speeches from his private train, which in the late 1800s was kind of like owning a private jet, you know? <laughs> Yeah, and guys, it would get pretty crazy on those trains, okay? Yeah, a lot of bare ankles. <laughs> yeah, a lot of folks wiggling some toes. Very naughty, very naughty. But look, America doesn't celebrate the strikes that gave us our precious weekend, the eight hour workday, a lunch break, the right to masturbate in bathrooms because we're living with our parents. America doesn't celebrate the, yeah. America doesn't celebrate the Black Panthers who were advocating for the truth, fighting for the working class, and ensuring that oligarchical oppression wouldn't continue. The winner shouldn't write the histories through their skewed lens. History belongs to us losers because we know the truth of how the winners won. The sixth point states this: We want all black men to be exempt from military service. We believe that black people should not be forced to fight in the, mil in, in the military service to defend a racist government that does not protect us. We will not fight and kill other people of yeah. color in the world who, like black people, are victimized by the white racist government of America. We will wow. protect ourselves from the force and violence of racist police and the racist military by whatever means necessary. Okay. To put this into context, this was during the Vietnam War, which a lot of people were actively protesting, not just the war, but also the draft. But this is still prevalent today because we're, the working class are the ones that are sent to go fight the illegal wars of the rich, to acquire resources that don't belong to them from black and brown countries. And if they want reparations out of it, that's gonna cost a little bit more than 40 acres and two mules. In fact, the cost of the American war machine is roughly $2 trillion. And there's no one asking, but where did the money go come from, you guys? <laughs> <That's> true. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. If we decrease the spending by half, 
we could fund Medicare for All and all of the infrastructure programs, which would cost $350 billion and an additional $22 billion to feed all of the Americans in this country. And then we'd still have enough left over for 40 acres and like way too many mules. <laughs> <laughs> Just so many mules, you guys. Mm. In today's pandemic climate, the whole world has decided to call a ceasefire for military operations. But instead in America, we have a former CIA director as our Secretary of State calling for more bombings of Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Yemen. And there is logic behind these actions, guys. Okay, if the virus, SARS-CoV-2, sees how big our explosions are, it'll then realize how big our dicks are. <laughs> <laughs> and then it won't try to invade America. That's flawless logic. It's flawless American exceptionalism logic right there. America also utilizes economic wars in the form of sanctions. From Iran, Venezuela to Nicaragua, American sanctions have been put into place specifically to hinder these nations' wealth and the distribution of aid and medical supplies. Why? Because you're evil, guys. Look, in Venezuela, Nicolas Maduro gave his people like groceries, okay? And, and then he canceled all the rents and mortgages. Guys, kindness is evil. You know, Gosh. guys, what's he up to over there? Right? Yeah. Just giving people food. <laughs> Communism, kindness, they both start with K's, so that's kind of something. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I know, I know there's probably some of you guys, right, asking, hey, why are we even trying to control Venezuela? And the official statement from the White House, I, just, I, did, I received it this week, the official statement from the White House is, uh, shut your dumb fucking face, you commie pinko asshat. Just shut up. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. America is also enacting an economic war against its own citizens. Look, there is an infinite reserve when it comes to the military budget, but a lot of confusion about math and balancing the books when we talk about, you know, things like Medicare for all, educating people, food stamps, and just helping poor people in general. A lot of confusion about it. Here's 1964, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and MLK pushed for a federal aid program for black Americans who much like poor white Americans were stuck in poverty. This would help both black and white Americans, right? Uh, and, uh, and the budget would rival the military budget, which it should. If you really want true equality in this country, I think we should fund programs that save lives at the same rate, if not more, than programs that take lives. I believe in the biz, it's, it's what's called the circle of life. Okay, it's the yin and the yang. It's like, the, it's like a seesaw in a playground, you guys, okay? You have to have two kids of equal weight to achieve balance. Mm. Yeah, but when the high school football jock wants to seesaw with the kindergartner, <laughs> you're uh. going to create a catapult, and that is an act of war. That is an act of war. <laughs> mm. For sure. Wow. Now, the seventh point we already talked about, it's about ending police brutality. We, we talked about that earlier. So let's move on to point number eight, which states, we want freedom for all black men held in federal, state, county, and city prisons uh, and jails. We believe that all black people should be released from the many jails and prisons because they have not received a fair and impartial trial. America has the largest prison population in the world because we don't really care what we're number one at as long as we're number one at it. <laughs> God. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> now in the case of Munta Kim, who we talked about earlier, it is ev evident uh, that the criminal justice system was trying to lock up a revolutionary. 
There's evidence about who actually fired the gun and killed the two officers. And it was proven that he, in fact, did not fire that gun. Yet, he still remains in prison today. In 1969, Bobby Seale was arrested after delivering an anti-war speech at a college in Chicago. He was invited to be there, right? He didn't like to show up and like grab a bullhorn and stop yelling like, <laughs> let me tell you about the motherfucking war. <laughs> <laughs> like, they invited him to talk and stuff. Seal was arrested for inciting violence. Again, I want to reiterate, he was making an anti-war speech, which is like literally the opposite of violence. Oh, man. Yeah. Now, they, this was, his, you have to remember, Bobby Seale is from San Francisco, right? Uh, when he was arrested and put on trial, they did not let him uh, wait for his attorney to show up from San Francisco. So he decided to represent himself, right? And here's, here's what happened. Bobby Seale was invited to speak. The revolution in this country that's occurring is in fact people coming forth demand freedom. He then left and didn't have anything to do with the demonstrations or riots or confrontations in Chicago. But he was arrested on the advice of the uh, FBI, and he was later indicted for that speech. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it gets crazier speech. because the judge would not allow Bobby Seale to defend himself. And it got so out of hand that they put tape around Bobby Seale's mouth and chucked oh. him to a chair. <laughs> oh my yeah. God. Look, the only thing the judge didn't do to prove how racist he was, was wear a clan hood during the trial. <laughs> this shit got so bad that people from all across the country were asking to stop the trial. Check this out. It started when Seal demanded to cross-examine a prosecution witness, accusing the judge of denying his constitutional rights to defend himself. The judge ordered him to sit down and be quiet, but the fiery Black Panther leader continued to cry out. <laughs> the judge told the marshals to hold him down, and that started several days of insanity. He kept insisting on his right to represent himself, and a judge's response to that was to order the bailiffs to put gaffer tape over his mouth and tie him to his chair. Oh, I mean, my God. It couldn't have been more definitive if they had put a sign on him saying slave. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but it turned out Bobby could make noise and say things through the gag. Nineteen sixty-nine, folks. In European countries, revolution who uh, revolutionaries who have committed far grander acts of violence have been set free after they served their sentence and express remorse, like Munta Kim, who expressed remorse about what happened to those police officers. Here's the thing. When it comes to criminal justice, America is like an abusive parent that sends their kids to their room without dinner, except that's, it's like for life. Like they do it like all the time. It's just forever. It's like a forever thing. Look, as long as Black Panther revolutionaries are in prison, but thieving bankers are not, this criminal justice system will not and cannot be trusted. So 
Um, the ninth point, or in point nine, uh, this states that we want all black people when brought to trial to be tried in a court by a jury of their peer group of people from their black communities. A de uh, as defined by the Constitution of the United States, we believe that the courts should allow the United States Constitution so that uh, black people will receive fair trials. The 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution gives a man to be tried by his peer group. A peer is a person from a similar economic, social, religious, geographical, environmental, mm. historical, and racial background. To do this, the court will be forced to select a jury from the black community from which the black def defendant came from. We have been and are being tried by all white juries that have no understanding of the average reasoning man of the black community. I think this one is pretty simple, right? Just because you're some white kid from the burbs that can quote Tupac doesn't mean that you'll understand the struggles of being black and brown in this country. But our justice system sure does like to think so because they can get jiggy with it, huh? Come on, am I right? <laughs> Guys, virtually every single Black Panther trial had a white jury when they were sentenced. Yeah, they did yeah. get jiggy. They got jiggy with oppression. I thought that was gonna hit, that's okay. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Uh, not a lot of Will Smith fans. That's fine. Uh, <laughs> and, and finally, the last point of the Black Panther's 10-point uh, program was uh, we want land, bread, housing, education, clothing, justice, and peace. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one of the people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitled them a decent respect of opinions of mankind require that they should declare the causes which impel them the separation. That sounds a little confusing, so let's break that down a little bit. <laughs> Remember, Hugh Newton was a law student. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Basically, what they're saying here is that any laws that separates, separate us from our rights to land, bread, housing, education, clothing, justice, and peace, we should separate ourselves from those laws. Mm. Yeah. This is basically calling for a divorce from an abusive system that exploits people for their labor and resources and gives them nothing in return. The problem is sometimes you have an ex that wants to like gaslight you and then set your shit on fire and taser you in the balls, but still say they like love you, you know, <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> oh, which, which makes the divorce process like way longer and more difficult. <laughs> I have to clarify, I don't, I'm not speaking from experience on the specifics. Of <laughs> 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 Some people might have to quit I, I, as, a, as a legal right. <laughs> now, look, I know some folks are going to say, well, Krish, look, we have a lot of these things, okay? America is not like living in the dark ages. Okay, we got rid of slavery here, kind of. And sure, <laughs> sure, we support slave labor in other countries, but that's because we need our devices to watch porn on the go. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a matter of efficiency. <laughs> but this is the difference between the white perspective and the minority perspective. A lot of white people compare the state now to where it used to be. And a lot of minority communities are talking about where it should be. These mm. 10 points mm. reflect where we should be while recognizing where we are and understanding where we come from. Now, as we did mention, the FBI was targeting the Black Panther Party and believed them to be a dangerous organization. And I know some folks might be thinking, hey, Krish, come on, you also mentioned that they were pretty aggressive towards the cops and such. So, you know, this would make sense. But 
the FBI wasn't involved with the Black Panthers when Cop Watch was put into place. They were too busy harassing Martin Luther King Jr. in 1965. Mm. Yeah, that's a true statement. They were sending him letters. Uh, I believe J. Edgar Hoover called him the most dangerous Negro in America. So, uh, yeah, fun facts about the FBI. Here's when the FBI set their minds to destroy the Black Panthers. It's when the Black Panthers started their nonviolent survival programs. Hmm. After his arrest in 1966, Bobby Seale was released from prison three years later, right? This is before all the stuff that we saw uh, a little bit ago. Now, upon his return to the party, he decided to implement more community-based programs. He called them survival programs, which had lasting effects in our country's history. Okay, these survival programs fell in line with the 10 points that the Panthers believed in and were necessary because the government was not taking care of any of these communities. One of the major things the Black Panthers did was enact Medicare for All within their communities. Hmm. And they did this by having Dr. Tobert Small talk to pharmaceutical companies to donate medicine and uh, doctors and nurses that volunteered at the George Jackson Free Clinic to ensure that people would have the checkups that they need despite all of their incomes. So check this out. So that is Tobert Small, Dr. Tobert. Dr. Tobert Small was a physician to the Black Panthers, though he wasn't a party member. They were not just people in black jackets carrying guns. They were interested in actually doing something for the community. The Black Panthers focused more on what they call survival programs, things like food assistance, free education, free legal aid. And one of their top priorities was free community health care. Most of our civilized countries will provide these services for the people. The Panthers realized that we didn't have a civilized country. We were not providing these services for the people. As a young doctor, Small treated political activists like Angela Davis and George Jackson in prison. And when Bobby Seale issued a directive for all chapters to establish free health clinics in 1970, the Black Panther Party turned to Dr. Small to help build the program. I had all the pharmaceutical companies donating medicines to the George Jackson Free Clinic. Mm -hmm. I had doctors volunteering, nurses volunteering, med techs volunteering. Mm. The wild part about that is that Dr. Small wasn't a party member. He was just a good Samaritan that saw what the Black Panther Party decided to do. And started helping them. Now, Bobby Seale put him in charge uh, to test as many Black folks as he could for sickle cell, which was a disease that was plaguing the Black community very specifically. The government had less than $100,000 in their budget allocated for this. Sickle cell name was a disease that affected uh, mostly Black folks. Sickle cell is the single most common genetic disease in the United States, and the vast majority of patients are African American. It's painful and deadly. And in 1970, the country only allocated less than $100,000 in funding. I spent $7.8 million on muscular dystrophy, $1.6 million on cystic fibrosis, $8 million to get a man on the moon. And obviously, sickle cell anemia was not a priority. Mm. Now, to be fair, the government had to murder a bunch of Asians in Vietnam and that was important because, you know, communism, which, yeah, guys, I don't want to scare anybody here, but communism has never actually set foot in America, which is why it's so dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> guys, that means that it doesn't even need feet to destroy freedom. Holy shit. <laughs> yeah. Here's the thing. You know, for as much as we are afraid of the reds in America, it's a wonder that we even kept that color on the flag, right? <laughs> yeah, and as, as for how racist the history of America is, I'm surprised that it didn't change the color of the flag to just three shades of white. You, know? <laughs> you could have eggshell, alabaster, and clan. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty solid. Now, the media was obsessed with the Panthers and their look. 
I mean, come on, they look badass, right? And they've kind of become the iconic look for what a revolutionary is supposed to be. The leather jackets, the berets, the afros, and Bobby Seal took advantage of that to shine a light on all of the survival programs that the Panthers had going for them. Self-proclaimed dreamer John Lennon invited Bobby Seale and a few other party leaders on national television to talk about their survival programs that they put into place, which eventually led to President Richard Marion Nixon signing a legislation to find a uh, cure for sickle cell anemia. So check this out. John Lennon invited Black Panther members and collaborators to appear on one of the most popular talk shows of the day, The Mike Douglas Show. And they seized the platform to address the problem of sickle cell disease. <laughs> we've tested 30,000 people in sickle cell for sickle cell anemia. I think we've tested more than anybody in the country. And just like that, sickle cell became part of the national conversation. The Panthers used their medical infrastructure to run tests for sickle cell in cities all over the country. So it is objectively true that one of the defining public health initiatives of the early 1970s wasn't launched by the U.S. government, but by an organized group of socialist advocates. The initiative gained so much momentum that President Nixon signed legislation to aid research on finding a cure for the disease. So, just in case anybody forgets real quick, the Panthers were actually enacting Medicare for All. And that means that Medicare for All can work, but it's just out of sheer callousness and greed from both parties that they continue to block it. And even Nixon kind of did a socialist thing. <laughs> wait, wait for it. That's again, the conservatives are having a stroke at just that statement being into the ether. <laughs> So here's the most famous of all of the survival programs, which was their free breakfast for kids program. Look, the Panthers noticed that uh, kids were getting fatigued and distracted in school. So uh, they realized that was coming from a lack of nutrition in the morning. So they decided to make sure that all of the kids in their community would be fed. On the first day, they fed about 11 kids. And by the end of their first week, they fed 135. Oh, wow. Yeah. And by the end of the year, they, they were feeding about 20,000 kids across 90 cities. This is what former, uh, how do they do it, right? So this is what uh, former Panther Bill X. Jennings points out. Uh, he says every op office was supposed to send two people so that they could learn how the program worked and start one in your area. And again, I want to point out that this idea was whitewashed as the Sith from the Star Wars franchise took this idea for nefarious deeds. <laughs> the Sith basically gentrified the rule of two, you guys. That's what they did. So the reason why this was so important is that this pro program transformed a lot of things within the party itself, right? Men were in the kitchen cooking for children in the 60s and 70s. Women were out there holding guns and leading the charge of these programs. They broke gender norms. The image of the revolutionary went from leather jackets and berets to an apron and a spatula. That's amazing. Mm. Bill X. Jennings calls this one of the biggest and baddest things that they ever did. And the Panthers are living proof that kindness, compassion, and community are the real revolutions. Hmm. And then in 1965, six years after the origin of the Panther Survival Program, Nixon instituted hmm. the breakfast program in every public school. And that is a direct result of the Black Panther Party. Wow. Yeah. No idea. Yeah. Not a lot of people did. And this was the only thing that they were doing. Right? It wasn't just breakfast and, and the healthcare stuff. They enacted free ambulance rides for people, free dental checkups. That's right. You get dental with the Black Panther Party. <laughs> yeah. Oh, gosh. Yeah. They had free busing to prisons so that you could see incarcerated loved ones. Mm -hmm. They had a free clothing and shoe program. Hell, they would even take kids off of the yards of the elderly and shook their fists at them, you know? <laughs> Yeah, it was just a variation of the black power symbol, right? It said black power, but also get the fuck off my lawn, you young whippersnapper. Huh? 
Mm-hmm. And this, my friends, is where the FBI comes in. As the success of these programs designed to help the American population grew, so did J. Edgar Hoover's and, and Richard Nixon's paranoia. And actually, there was a contest between Hoover and Nixon on who could be the more paranoid, racist, wrinkly mm. old white man. Mm. Quite the contest. Mm. <laughs> J. Edgar Hoover said that these survival programs represent the best and most influential activity going on for the BPP, and as such, is potentially the greatest threat to the effort by authorities to neutralize the BPP and destroy what it stands for. That's right, folks. According to the FBI, the greatest threat to the nation were kids with full bellies and medicine. Oh. So, to break that down just a little bit, J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI said that a positive thing for low-income communities was a threat to the state and that these programs are exactly what the Black Panther Party stands for and they have to destroy that. So essentially, they are going to run a covert counterintelligence coup against the American people. And that is the most accurate word for the FBI, counterintelligence. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> because everything in that statement is counter to the intelligence of a well-run society and government. Mm. Just stupid. <laughs> so, this program was called Co-Intel Pro or Counterintelligence Pro. Uh, <laughs> you guys know when you guys download an app and there's like a free version of that app. They call it like the light version, right? And then when you purchase the full oh, version yeah. called the pro, yeah, this was basically the full version of counterintelligence, right? The light <laughs> version was just like profusely using the N word way too much, like all the time, you know? <laughs> and also indiscriminately killing black people. Like they also did that. That was also part of the light program. But this, but this pro version, boy, that was really gonna take that Jim Crow cake. We're going to nail it. <laughs> there were 290 counterintelligence programs, and 245 were dedicated to the Black Panthers. That's 85% of their dumbassery that was targeted at a group <laughs> that was helping feed kids. <laughs> and I got to I want to. I know some people might get mad, but dumbassery is a synonym of counterintelligence. So that's a <laughs> super accurate statement. Here's the thing. To, to J. Edgar Hoover, any type of black organizing was a threat to the status quo. The status quo being over-policed and poor communities of color that don't say anything when injustice happens in their communities. He wrote in COINTELPRO uh, that it was set to expose, disrupt, misdirect, discredit, neutralize the so-called black nationalist movements. Check this out. The purpose of this new counterintelligence endeavor is to expose, disrupt, misdirect, discredit, or otherwise neutralize the activities of black nationalists. Neutralize could mean making somebody an informant or putting somebody in jail or having somebody killed. So the term neutralize was just like a feel-good word for state-sponsored murder. Huh. Yeah. Now, see, this is the type of dis disruption that the Democrats and the Republicans can really get behind. You know, if you protest killer cops and disrupt the daily life of complacent Americans, you are dubbed a terrorist. But if you imprison and kill organizers by propagandizing the narrative, you're a valued government official. Mm. Now the FBI would create suspicion by following Panthers, tap their phone lines, harassing family members, and even send letters of infidelity to loved ones. Oh, the FBI was coming around, my mother-in-law and my wife, and uh, um, for me to stop that kind of activity, I stopped going home. And a lot of other people did also to protect their families. 
you could kind of, in a sense, say we abandon our families for the Panther Party. Yeah, every person involved in COINTELPRO was the school's fucking hall monitor, right? That would tell on you and go to the principal if, if they caught you kissing in the, in the hallway, mm-hmm. you know? These guys are wound up so tight that this program should have been called Co-Incel Pro. You guys get it? <laughs> That's a solid joke, you guys. You guys gave me like a B plus response. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they use these letters to create informants and uh, they were very opportunistic about misdemeanors from young black men they would use to infiltrate uh, the Black Panther Party uh, and this was to fulfill one of the mission statements that the FBI had to destroy the Panthers so here's how they uh, would create informants my recruitment by the FBI was very efficient very simple, really. Um, I'd stolen a car and uh, went joyriding on the state limit. limit. And, and uh, uh, they had a potential case against me, and I was looking for an opportunity to uh, work it off. And um, a couple of months later, that opportunity came when uh, uh, FBI agent Roy Mitchell asked me to uh, go down to the local office of the Black Panther Party and try to uh, gain membership. Mm. They wanted to prevent the appeal of a radical political movement on the black youth, right? They basically wanted to uncool the revolution by showing everybody how great it could be if you're, you know, like a paranoid, delusional racist that hasn't seen their dick in 30 years. (laughs) What a cool Mm. thing, you guys. (laughs) (laughs) J. Edgar Hoover took this paranoia and he went on national television claiming that the Panthers were a dangerous terrorist organization. You know all those terrorist organization and dictators always like feeding children and clothing the poor, you know, delivering <laughs> medicine, uh, man, helping the elderly cross the street. All those dictators doing that. What a bunch of manies. Huh? You guys remember mm-hmm. how Al-Qaeda was like just trying to deliver like a plane, plane full of pizza on 9-11 to hardworking Americans? Mm. You know, and no. then there was this like, too much pizza grease on the instruments, huh? Oh man! Oh god! Oh boy, those ter- goofy terrorists, huh? Those goofballs. No. Because he made that public statement on national television, this let the cops drop whatever little civil liberties they were respecting to go guns a blazing to kill some Panthers. The Panthers uh, were a criminal organization. Were violent, and they wanted to kill cops. That's all I needed to know. About 40 policemen arrived on the scene and began surrounding the Black Panther headquarters. They were trying to change government as we know it through terrorist uh, activity. We took a very proactive stance in combating what we consider a terrorist organization. I think the FBI manipulated the police. The FBI arranged for the Black Panthers to get guns through informants, they would convince the police that the Panthers had weapons. They had to go in and be ready to be shot at, so the police went in and shot at them first. You hear about raids Uh, taking place against Black Panther officers. They were coming to kill us. Police say there was sniper fire throughout the early morning hours. They moved in cautiously and then began shooting. The Black Panther... Oh, my God. So the FBI manipulated various departments of uh, uh, various different, like, police departments by spinning these wondrous tales of of these Black Panthers that would transform into literal Black Panthers, you know, Mm. with, like, Gatling guns on their backs. (laughs) Yeah. And there there were also some rumors that the FBI was spreading where where they could also turn into that tiger from He-Man. You guys remember that? (laughs) So just a a little recap there is the cops are the ones that started escalating things with the Panthers first. Mm -hmm. And then the FBI not only excused this, but they fanned their flames, which might go to show that paranoia is actually a contagious virus. So 
<laughs> it, it doesn't even end there. The cops not only raided Panther pads and uh, Panther HQs, but also just arrested scores of rank and file members. And one of these, the largest examples of this was when the entire party leadership of the New York City Black Panther Party was arrested on a bombing conspiracy charges with absolutely no evidence, right? Because, and they became known as the Panther 21, because every illegally racist crime needs to have a fun name for like the t-shirts and stuff, you know? Oh my God. <laughs> a New York grand jury has indicted 21 alleged Black Panthers on charges of plotting several bombings in the city tomorrow. On April 2nd, 1969, in uh, pre-dawn raids, 21 Black Panthers were charged with all kinds of terrorist activity. These are some of the men the police are accusing of being involved in the plot which could have wounded or killed scores of busy New Yorkers. Twelve men were arrested today, two are already in jail, and seven more are still at large. And so the Panther 21 started. He was uh, one of the kids that was arrested. <laughs> He's 16. So, you know, they were trying to raise money for the Panther Defense Funds to pay these extraordinarily high legal fees. Um, and it was too much for just regular people to, uh, to pay for. So they had to recruit famous people like Jane Fonda and Marlon Brando, right? And after 13 months of trials and retrials, they were found innocent. Mm. Yeah. After a 13-month yeah. trial, when New York State spent millions of dollars and put dozens of witnesses and hundreds of pieces of evidence, a jury deliberated for three hours. The jury have considered all the counts and charges against the defendants and have found them not guilty. <laughs> there were 156 not guilty verdicts. It was astonishing. Yeah. Courtroom erupted. The city erupted. There were people dancing in the streets as word spread. Come on over. Juries, defendants, everybody, we're all here. 640 Broadway. Most of the defendants have been in jail for more than two years, unable to raise the high bail set for mm. The trial lasted eight months. Mm. The jury reached its verdict of innocent on all counts in less than four hours including the longest criminal proceeding in New York State right. history. What it was on the part of the jury to me, I don't know how each individual juror feels, but together they have rejected once and for all a society which refuses to allow change. They said you must allow people to get together and think about changing life and the way they live. And it, it's a beautiful victory. So this was the full sweep of tactics that the FBI used, right? They went after the Panthers as violently as they could. They depleted their people power by arresting them. They depleted their economic resources with, with, and hung them up in, in litigation so that they couldn't focus on the survival programs, which by the way, continued to thrive despite all of this FBI fuckery. They used manipulation so that kids would stay hungry. That's what the FBI represents. They represent starving children. Now, this is the craziest part of COINTELPRO. This is the final part of their mission statement, and that was to prevent the rise of a black messiah. Yeah, J. Edgar Hoover <gasps> was terrified, yeah, of the rise of a black messiah that would come forth, speak clearly and eloquently, and liberate the working class people against the oppressive government, right? Usually, when we have people they're like, speaking of looking for messianic figures, we put them into psychiatric care. But in America, they're granted a high power job with like 100% of the benefits, including dental. They also get dental. Yeah. This, this notion of trying to find the Black Messiah is why he directed Bobby Seale to be arrested over an anti-war speech in 1969. And the worst part about it is it led to the death of young Fred Hampton. Now, Fred Hampton, who's the fourth person um, in that picture, uh, was uh, the leader of the Chicago chapter 
of the Black Panther Party, and he was 20 when he did that. By age 20, my biggest accomplishment uh, was bonging a beer without <laughs> crying. Yeah. Now here's the thing, Fred Hampton was a magnetic speaker. And, and he, had, he was one of the most accomplished Black Panthers around, right? Fred Hamptons was working together with Latin and white gangs, dissolving their disputes and bringing them into the fold. Here's some of the speeches that he had. I've been feeling going through all types of physical and mental torture, but that's all right, because we said even before this happened, and we're going to say it after this, and after I'm locked up, and after everybody's locked up, that you can jail revolutionaries but you can't jail a revolution. Right. Mm. You might want to liberate like every slave out the country, but you can't run liberation out the country. You might murder a freedom fighter like Bobby Hutton, but you can't murder freedom fighting. Whatever it was, Fred had it. And these people in this class have divided themselves. They say, I'm black and I hate white people. I'm white and I hate black people. I'm Latin American and I hate hillbillies. I'm hillbillies and I hate Indians. So we fight amongst each other. Fred Hampton here in Chicago is the main voice for racial unity. Black Panther Party stood up and said that we don't care what anybody says. We don't think you fight fire with fire, bitch. We think you fight fire with water, bitch. We're going to fight racism, not racism, but we're going to fight the solidarity. We worked with organizations such as the Young Lords, a Puerto Rican street gang that had become political, and the Young Patriots, Hillbillies, Appalachian White Boys, Introduce a man come over tonight from another part of town, but he's fighting for some of the same causes we're uh, fighting for. Bob Lee, who was our uh, deputy field marshal, had a meeting with them, and he was explaining why we should work together. That police brutality up here, there's rats and roaches. Uh, there's poverty up there. That's the first thing that we can, we, we can unite on. That's the common thing we have, man. But I want you people to stick together, and I'll stick with black friends, and they'll stick with me, and I know they will. Mm. Look, nothing shrivels a racist dick like solidarity that goes beyond melanin content. Okay? <laughs> and what you just saw there made J. Edgar Hoover's dick go concave. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Ray, Hubert was afraid that Hampton might be the Black Messiah, so he decided to have uh, his personal bodyguard, William O'Neill, uh, who was an FBI informant, tip off the Chicago Police Department that there were illegal guns in his panther pad. So O'Neill gave them the layout of the apartment, and the Chicago Police Department murdered Fred Hampton. And the media lied about it. So this is the last clip we're going to watch. It's a bit long. It's a bit intense. Hang with me. J. Edgar Hoover most feared young whites uniting with the Blacks struggle. And he was most afraid of uh, what he called a, a Black Messiah uh, rising up out of this movement. Fred Hampton was very good at running an organization. He could delegate responsibility. He could spot talent. The one thing that he failed to spot, however, was the FBI plant, who was, of course, his personal bodyguard. I routinely supplied whatever floor plans or diagrams I could. Uh, to the FBI. I, that started in June 1969. I mean, they had a floor plan and keys to the Black Panther headquarters. Close to 12 midnight, William O'Neill came and picked me up and brought me back to our apartment. Chairman Fred had been running 24 seven trying to organize, so he fell asleep. I was uh, eight and a half uh, months pregnant with our son, so I fell asleep too. Police attached to the Cook County State's Attorney's Office raided a Chicago apartment shared by two high-ranking members of the Black Panther Party before dawn today. The police were acting on a tip that a supply of weapons was in the apartment. The State's Attorney recreated 
the layout of the Panther apartment and uh, made arrangements for them to produce his version of what happened. He stands up, I stand, I stepped over, and I put the foot up. Short first, we realized that there are still some people remaining. And before I could get past the threshold, there were three shots fired from the rear bedroom. The immediate violent criminal reaction of the occupants in shooting at announced police officers emphasizes the extreme viciousness of the Black Panther Party. So does their refusal to cease firing at the police officers when urged to do so several times. When the 15-minute gun battle was over, two Black Panthers were dead. Police and Panthers differ about what happened. In the apartment, we received no warning, no tear gas, nothing to offer us to surrender or, or come out. Bullets start coming through the walls, plaster flying. I saw a bullet coming from it looked like the front of the apartment, from the kitchen area. They were, pigs were just shooting. This cop stepped to the door with a submachine gun and all you could see was a silhouette and the uh, muzzle flashes as he fired, you know, a fully automatic weapon into uh, a room that was barely six feet wide. Huh. Mm -hmm. I laid on top of Chairman Fred and I could feel even through him, the matches vibrating. You could feel the bullets going into it. I just knew we'd be dead, everybody in there. Cop stepped back in and uh, fired off another round, hit me in the hips. Everything was like this. It was just going so fast. We told them we were wounded, and they said, come out with your hands up. One of them grabbed my robe, and they swung it open and said, oh, what do you know? We got a broad here. And then another one grabbed my hair and slung me into the kitchen area. I heard a voice say, He's barely alive. He's, he'll barely make it. They started shooting, up, shooting again. I heard a sister scream. They stopped shooting. Pig said, he's good and dead now. It was like a slaughterhouse. And there was blood all over the place. When we lifted the mattress up to look underneath, Three forty-five caliber machine gun slugs fell out of the mattress. Only one shot came from a Panther weapon because Mark Clark, the young kid who answered the door, was shot in the heart as he answered the door, and the gun dropped and went off through the ceiling. All of the splinters were coming into the apartment. So we said, this was a shooting. It wasn't a shootout. There's gas that the police department uses as standard equipment that nobody can stand to stay in the room with it. They could have shot four canisters of gas in there and waited outside for everybody to come out. Mm. So I'll take a deep breath. <sighs> yeah. So this is what happens when people put down their hatred over melanin content. Right? This is what happens when you decide to feed people and clothe people and provide basic needs and show a government that has ignored everybody that we are self-sufficient and don't need their shriveled dicks getting in our way. The Panthers moved towards a peaceful direction and the FBI used the police as a force of violence to run them down. The Panthers ceased to be in 1982. Right, Huey Newton, uh, when he got out of prison, was... Um, he started getting into drugs. He had a lot of depression. Uh, Eldridge Cleaver, who was running violent operations in Algeria, was, was having conflicts with, with Huey Newton. So the FBI would send letters to each of them, instigating them both. The FBI really liked to use this letter writing campaign, right? They were basically like the civil rights deadliest pen pal, you know? <laughs> Not just that, but because the FBI and the cops were harassing their family, the Panthers became isolated to themselves just to make sure that their families would be safe. The FBI made a revolutionary road a lonely one. 
Now, eventually, Bobby Seale dis distanced himself from the party as well. In fact, he actually ran for mayor in Oakland on Panther philosophies and actions. So Seale in Oakland in the 70s increased voter registration because people actually wanted to vote for him instead of against his opponent. Go figure. When you run a campaign where you'll ensure that you'll work for the people, the people want to participate in an election. Now, there are those in this society that will keep gaslighting us to believe that socialism is never going to work in America. But the Black Panthers are proof that it will. They were able to provide health care, elder assistance, shelter, food, water to all these communities that the corporate duopoly forgot. The FBI and the police made the Panthers defend themselves and these communities, all these community programs by ha forcing them to take up arms. The FBI lied, they cheated, and uh, unfortunately, the American populace fell for it. We were grifted out of a better future. Look, the legacy of the Panthers is not what the media portrays of them. They weren't violent black militants or cop killers. The legacy of the Black Panthers was in the work of the rank and file to create community. The words of solidarity from Bobby Seale and Fred Hampton, the intellect of Huey Newton, and even the sass of Eldridge Cleaver, who, I remind you, said that he would beat the shit out of Ronald Reagan with a marshmallow. <laughs> yeah. What they did was they exposed the underbelly of a paranoid, conspiratorial, corrupt system in every which way. So don't let their history be written by the bad guys that won. Thank you guys so much for tuning into this episode. If you guys enjoyed this content, please make sure that you hit the like button and the share button. Get this out there to as many people as you can. Send it out to some friends. Send it out to some enemies. Send it out. Put it, put it in some groups. Um, content like this is often suppressed and it is up to, uh, I depend on you guys to share this stuff out and like this stuff to make sure that it's shown to new people um, and new people learn about this channel. And if you haven't, uh, please hit the subscribe button uh, to make sure that you are getting notifications when we put videos up. I'm going to be putting videos up every single week on this channel, content like this, uh, more, more scripted uh, comedy content. There will be some rantier content, some audio content, some interview stuff uh, coming up as well. Um, these, what you're seeing in these videos is from the Citizen Revolution live virtual comedy shows uh so if you are a a a fan of uh this this sort of stuff and you want to see it live uh in a virtual setting of course um please uh, get tickets for these shows um what i'm doing with these shows is uh 50 of the ticket sales is going to a grassroots organization uh activist uh journalists venues across the country people that really need help uh that aren't being helped by uh by by the federal government right now so so it's up to us to help each other out and this is this is me doing my part uh so since i talk about these larger ideas these socially conscious topics uh, in my comedy, I figured I should. Um, I, I wanted to donate to uh, to groups that stand for these these causes and issues and ideas that I uh, talk about often, uh, especially on this channel. This particular show, uh, I donated 100% of the ticket sales to the Black Visions Collective in Minneapolis, Minnesota. They are a uh, POC queer driven community-based uh, organizers that are helping out protesters that have uh, been wrongfully arrested for the act of protesting. So I donated 100% of the ticket sales to that. So if, if you're watching this video, you weren't able to make it to the to live stand-up comedy show where we discuss the Black Panthers and you want to donate to the Black Vision Collective, the links are in the description below. So please check out the links, uh, the ticket links and the donation links and um, make sure that you share. Um, like I said, the, the Citizen Revolution comedy shows, they happen every Friday at 9 p.m. If you want to, you can, um, you can, you can check out all of the dates uh, on my website at ramennoodlescomedy.com. That's R-A-M-A-N noodlescomedy.com. Uh, as a, a full-time touring performer 
that has basically lost the majority of, uh, of my work. Uh, being a touring performer, uh, these virtual comedy shows, sustaining memberships and album sales are pretty much how I'm going to be earning my living right now. And it's also a way that I can um, continue to help, uh, like I said, grassroots organizations, activists, journalists, and small business venues that I've worked with across the country uh, that are um, that are, that are kind of struggling right now. So uh, yeah, so if you want to uh, check out the links in the description, but make sure you hit that subscribe, make sure you hit that share button, make sure you hit that like button and get the word out. Uh, you can follow me on a bunch of social media stuff at Krish Mohan Ha Ha and stay tuned for more videos because we are going to be uh, putting up weekly videos on this channel. Uh, discussing big topics like this, discussing topics that you don't normally see on uh, on any sort of mainstream media or uh, any sort of mainstream comedy channels. Uh, thank you for tuning in. I really appreciate it. Until next week, see you on the road, everybody.